started at the Medulla Oblongata and we worked our way up, um, you know, through the, uh, the pons, the cerebellum, the midbrain, um, the diencephalon, the thalamus and hypothalamus. And then we talked a little bit at the end of last time about the basal nuclei, what they do. Um, so now we get to the cerebral cortex or the, uh, uh, the outermost part of the brain, um, the, this, the wrinkly part. Oh, I got to start the show. Hold on. Cool. And this is where some of the fanciest stuff that the brain does happens. Um, the, the interconnections between the neurons that coat the surface of the brain are really what give us our intelligence. Um, because there are so many of those neurons and they're so uh, connected to one another, it allows us to do all the fancy things that we're able to do. Um, the, uh, the cerebral cortex um, has four lobes, so it has four named parts. There's a frontal lobe here in the front. Um, there's a parietal lobe kind of in the middle at the top. The occipital lobe is here in the back. And then the, um, uh, para or the temporal lobe, parietal lobe up here, temporal lobe here um, on the sides. And different regions of the brain are responsible for different things. Um, of particular importance are uh, these two areas right here. So um, dividing the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe is a groove called the central sulcus. And that's, that central sulcus is an important landmark because the gyrus, a gyrus is one of these uh, wrinkles. So, um, you know, like this right here and follow it around, that's a gyrus. We have a post-central gyrus, in other words, the gyrus behind the central sulcus, and then we have a pre-central gyrus, or the gyrus in front of the central sulcus. These are two very important parts of the brain because the pre-central gyrus is responsible for motor control, and the post-central gyrus right here is responsible for sensation. So um, that anatomy is, is important for you to know, as, we'll, uh, as I'll show you here in a minute. All right. And then the, uh, the cerebellum um, uh, lies below, you know, under the pons and medulla we've already talked about. All right. So the occipital uh, temporal um, and occipital parietal, it doesn't look like there's a division between them, right? There is, but you can only see it from the inside of the brain, not from the outside. So you just kind of have to know that the occipital lobe is here in the back. Um, the temporal lobe, parietal lobe, even though there isn't a division like there is um, for the central sulcus. Dividing the frontal lobe from the temporal lobe is this groove right here, and that's the lateral sulcus. So that one's easy to see, that division. But the uh, divisions between the parietal, temporal, and occipital are not as easy to see. Yeah? The two gyruses, are those part of any of the lobes? Are they part of the frontal lobe? Yes. Lobes? The precentral gyrus is part of the frontal lobe, and the postcentral gyrus is part of the parietal lobe. Good question. All right. <clears throat> so um, uh, looking at where some of these, uh, or what some of these regions do, so <clears throat> the motor cortex, um, which is right here, that uh, pre-central gyrus, these are where the neurons exist that control our muscles, <clears throat> that initiate actions, you know, so kind of an important place in the brain. If you were to have massive damage in this area, you'd have paralysis. You wouldn't be able to move your muscles because the nerves that do that have, are gone. Um, next to that uh, motor cortex is what we call an association area. Now, what, what uh, the neurons in this region they combine and integrate information from different parts of the brain. And uh, for example, in this one, the somatic motor association area, neurons here would be planning actions. The neurons here actually carry those actions out. But of course, if you don't know what you're going to do, you're not going to be very good at it. So these association areas are the place where planning and decision making happens. Um, and then uh, the uh, primary cortex then carries that out. Similar to the, um, <clears throat> the sensory cortex, which is here in the post-central gyrus, next to it, it has an association area too. Fine to sense things, but ideally you want to take the sensation and make some sense out of it, right? You know, you feel something on your skin, well, you want to figure out what that is and what it means. So that's what takes place then in this somatic sensory association area. 
is creating understanding out of sensation. <clears throat> uh, for the um, uh, temporal lobe down here, its claim to fame is it's where the auditory cortex is. So all, of sa all the sound information, all the information from the ears is processed by the temporal lobes on both sides. So again, we have a primary auditory cortex that receives that information directly from the ear, but then we have an association area surrounding it that makes sense out of that information. You know, your, your ear is hearing sounds, but your auditory association area is making words out of those sounds so that you can understand, you know, what I'm saying. Um, and then the occipital lobe has the visual cortex um, and its associated association area. So, you know, the uh, information from the retina and the eyes comes here first, but then the visual association areas make sense out of that information. So we have this common pattern, you know, motor control in the frontal lobe, uh, parietal uh, or uh, sen uh, sensory touch sensation in the uh, parietal lobe and uh, making sense of it. Auditory is associated with the uh, temporal lobe, and then vision is associated with the occipital lobe. All right. All right, so if association areas make sense out of things, integration areas make uh, sense out of that sense or make decisions or planning or judgment, higher order thinking. Um, so we have a large integration area um, in the uh, front of the frontal lobe called the prefrontal cortex. And um, at least in modern understanding, we believe that this area of the brain is responsible for the highest order thinking that we do. You know, things like critical analysis, things like, um, you know, uh, a planning for future events, um, these very complex cognitive tasks usually take place in the frontal lobe. So um, the prefrontal cortex is what makes us, you know, smart, so to speak. Um, we have a couple of other integration areas. Broca's area, which is right here, sits kind of between the temporal lobe. Remember, the temporal lobe is responsible for um, auditory processing, and the frontal lobe responsible for motor. And it's the speech center. So it controls how we make sounds to have meaning associated with those sounds. So um, uh, an old mnemonic is damage to Broca's area causes broken speech um, because it's the speech creation center. So if you have a stroke that affects this area, you may be able to understand words just fine, but you will struggle with putting them together properly and, uh, and creating the sounds. So that's Broca's area. Um, there's a, uh, a, a similar area called Wernicke's area, it's right here, between the temple and parietal lobes. And it's responsible, it's called the general interpretive area now. Um, but it's important in understanding language. So, for example, if a person has a stroke that's affecting this area, they may be able to speak their thoughts just fine, but they can't understand the words of others not written or uh, spoken. So it's, you know, you get some really fascinating disorders with damage to the brain, but that's Wernicke's area. Wernicke's and Broca's area are very well described. So they're commonly, you know, they appear on board exam questions and stuff like that. So those two areas you should commit to memory. So it's the speech center that makes speech, that's Broca's area. The uh, Wernicke's area or the general interpretive area is the reception of speech, um, uh, understanding what's been said. And then um, <clears throat> there's a little segment uh, uh, of the frontal lobe called the frontal eye field. This controls eye movements, but not the instinctual kind, you know, like um, that uh, keep our eyes stable as we walk, for example. These are learned eye movements. So like when you're reading, for example, <clears throat> you know, you don't think about it, but your eyes are scanning the page. Uh, so it's the frontal eye field that makes that um, uh, possible. So these are just a few of the integration areas. I mean, uh, like I said, uh, when we started this chapter, you can't get into very much detail about the brain without it getting very complicated very fast. So we're sort of staying at 20,000 feet here and looking at just some general um, uh, uh, locations. Because the whole cortex has functions. Um, we're just looking at a few of them. Is the prefrontal cortex what makes you, like, remember or recognize what you see? So is damage to the prefrontal cortex, like when people can't recognize No, it isn't memory, it's judgment. 
It's judgment and planning, critical thinking. That's what happens in the prefrontal cortex. So you might remember things, but you don't know how to make decisions about what you remember. So where, like, there are people that don't recognize faces or can't recognize certain things. What the image or what? Image There's a facial like? recognition area that's um, right about oh, here. Okay. So damage there can cause that. Yeah. Um, uh, not being able to identify objects can actually be associated with the speech center error because you can't find the word to describe the thing you're looking at. Yeah. All right. So we have these funny uh, people-shaped things called homunculi, which is a fun word to say. Um, a homunculus is just a uh, representing a thing using a human form is all that word means. So, you know, we have our, uh, our sensory um, cortex and our motor cortex. And if we start at the center here and we work our way out, what we'll see is that there's a consistent pattern of, of mapping. In other words, on everybody, the, the area of the cortex that's responsible for the thumb, let's say, is in approximately the same place on everyone. So um, you can see that you know, uh, we start you know, from the intra-abdominal organs, and then we come all the way around, and we end at the genitalia. So this funny picture, what it's trying to show you is how much space is set aside for these various body regions. So for example, the back, um, where's the back? I guess that's not really there. Um, well, here, we'll look at the hand. You can see that the thumb and the fingers have a lot of space, but the wrist and the forearm have very little. You know that your fingers are much more sensitive than your forearm is, right? So your fingers and thumb need more brain space, so to speak, than your forearm does in order to manage all that sensation that's coming in. It's like the face. You know, the face is very sensitive to sensation. So it has a huge amount of cortex that's dedicated just to it. Um, <clears throat> same with, uh, you know, the tongue has a good long spot. So this is the sensory homunculus here. And we can do the same thing with the motor system. Um, so all of the uh, areas of the body have a mapping to the uh, precentral uh, uh, gyrus or the primary motor cortex. And here again, the size of the representation is the amount of space, so to speak, that the brain has taken up um, uh, to control the muscles in that area. So like, uh, you know, here is, you know, here's your hip and leg, right? So not very much space. Your hand has more brain space than your whole leg does. Why? Because the hands have a lot of fine control, right? There's all those muscles in the forearm that are driving everybody nuts trying to learn in lab. And they can all move independently. So the brain has to have a lot of space for the hand because it can do so many things. So these are the, the sensory and motor homunculus. All right. Not really any testable information here. This is more of a, a visual representation of how the cortex is organized um, in both for uh, sensation and then for motor control. All right. So the, uh, the left and the right sides of the brain are not the same. You know, you might think that they're just copies of each other, but they're not. Um, the, uh, there are a great many functions that are lateralized. In other words, they take place on one side of the brain or the other, but not both. Um, so some examples, that speech center, Broca's area like we talked about, it's only on the left side. There isn't a, there isn't a right-sided speech center in most people. Um, <clears throat> writing and uh, is on uh, the left side as well, but analyzing things by touch is on the right side. So a person... Um, uh, may not be able to recognize something by touch, but they'll still be able to write, and it depends on which side of the brain was damaged. You know, so a, a stroke here may leave a person unable to write, even though they can recognize objects by touch. So we have lateralization. Um, uh, the left side of the brain has that general interpretive center, or Wernicke's area, um, which is not just responsible for understanding language, but also things like mathematics, logic, calculation, those kinds of things. Again, we don't have anything similar on the other side. Instead, we have an area of the right side of the brain 
that specializes in spatial relationships. You know, so if I were to tell you to imagine a, a cube in, in your mind and, and then now make it spin, that's this right side of the brain, spatial visualization and analysis. All right. And then uh, the way the brain handles the eyes is a little counterintuitive. You know, you might think that the left eye uh, information would go to the right side of the brain and the right eye information would go to the left, right? Because we all learned in health class that everything crosses on its way to the brain, right? But that isn't how it works. Instead, information from both eyes goes to both visual cortexes. And the way it's divided is by visual field. So what's a visual field? If you think about what you're seeing right now and you were to divide that in half, the left side of that would be your left visual field, the right side of that your right visual field. And the way the nerves cross here is all the information from the left side of the world or the left side of your visual field goes to the right side of the brain and all the information from the right side of the world or your right visual field goes to the left side of the brain. So um, a very common way to represent this is with colors. So you know, left is in red and right is in blue. And you can see that the red information crosses, it kind of half crosses right here, but all the red ends up here and all the blue ends up here. So it's visual field uh, uh, is how it's divided. And there again, you can get some very interesting disorders with the brain. If you've had a stroke back here in your um, uh, left occipital cortex, patients who've had that have a tendency to ignore things that are on the right side of the world. In other words, in a room, they'll have decorated one half, but not the other. You know why? Because the area of the brain responsible for, for doing that seeing doesn't work. So all they see is the left half of everything, and the right half is ignored because there's no uh, neurons there to process that information. So you can get some very interesting um, disorders. All right. Okay, onward. So these areas of the brain are not isolated. One of the things that makes our brain so complex is that there are connections. Everything's connected together. So even though we have this Broca's area that's responsible for speech, it doesn't work in isolation. It works in connection with all the other different areas of the brain. <clears throat> so we have a number of fibers. Um, these are axons that are traveling from one part of the brain to another. And there are so many of them that it almost creates a kind of skeleton inside the brain because these axons are usually myelinated, um, so they are, are white in appearance instead of gray like the cortex is. So we have association fibers that connect the different areas, and then we have the arcuate fibers that connect adjacent areas. So essentially, everything in the brain is connected. And then the left and right sides are also connected um, through, uh, through huge bundles of axons that cross the midline. So the largest one is called the corpus callosum, and it sits here in the middle. This isn't a good picture of it because it actually extends the whole length of the, uh, of the left and right hemispheres. And then we have the anterior commissure at the bottom, which also connects the left and right. So even though the left side of the brain is fairly independent and the right side of the brain is too, they have connections with each other so that, you know, the spatial relationship that is being uh, thought about on the right side of the brain can be described by Broca's area on the left side of the brain. So the two sides of the brain are very um, connected. Now, as uh, we learned about the brain and this lateralization, there was a whole movement in psychology and neuroscience to talk about left brain stuff and right brain stuff. And I'm sure that many of you have heard about that in previous classes, maybe taken a test to see if you were left-brained or right-brained. Modern thinking is, is moving away from that. Um, even though there, there are different functions on the different sides, the, brain, the two sides of the brain are always working so closely together that it really doesn't matter. You, know, you can't really be right-brained or left-brained. Um, you, you, you just are who you are and you have these characteristics, but it may not have anything to do with your brain. So I know many of us have, have heard that kinds of things. All right. Uh, I don't know what we're talking about. Okay. So our first question. 
Which of the following is not a lobe of the cerebrum? And I'll get the question to you in just a second. There we go. All right, that one was kind of a softball, right? We've all heard of these lobes before. So the sphenoid is a bone in the skull, right? But it doesn't have a lobe associated with it. The others do. If you remember your skull anatomy, you know, you had a parietal bone, a frontal bone, an occipital bone, and a temporal bone. So the lobes of the brain were actually named based on the bones that overlie them. Um, so uh, you don't have any new terms to learn. All right, during brain surgery, the superior portion of the postcentral gyrus of a patient is stimulated. Uh, the patient is most likely to do which of those things? This one must have been a little tougher. So jump in there, Callie. Okay, so the real key to answering this question is to know what the postcentral gyrus is. So the postcentral gyrus is that first uh, gyrus of the parietal lobe. It's the primary sensory cortex. Sensory cortex. So flexing your fingers, that's not sensation, that's motor, right? That's motor motion. Talking to the surgeon, same thing, that's motion. Smile, that's also motion. Now, you might think that it's sensation, but to smile, you have to move muscles in your face, right? So that is also motor. Um, and then E, moving your hand, also motor. So which of those is, the, is sensory? Well, it's D, feel pressure on his toes. And it also turns out that the, the leg and feet are at the top part of this gyrus. So the postcentral gyrus is all sensation, particularly touch sensation. And then the precentral gyrus is um, all motor control. So everything that skeletal muscles do. All right. So that's sort of the brain. You know, we we uh, gave or we went through a tour last time and we talked about the cerebrum today. That's where we leave it. You know, could we jump in and spend the next six weeks, you know, studying just the brain and all it does? Of course we could, but we're not going to do that. So we're going to take a step back then, and we're going to move to the next topic in this chapter, which is the cranial nerves. All right. This is one of these classic, you, you just have to learn it, you just have to memorize it, because you'll get asked about it. Now, you know, is this knowledge particularly clinically useful out there in the real world? Maybe if you're a neurosurgeon or you work in, uh, with uh, closed head injury patients, but for most normal healthcare workers, this doesn't come up after training. However, it comes up on exams. So you do have to learn these. Uh, there are 12 of them, um, and we're going to go through each one. So what is a cranial nerve in the first place? It, a cranial nerve is a nerve that comes directly out of the brain. You know, we started with the spinal cord, and most of the nerves of the body are spinal nerves. In other words, they came out of the spinal cord. Cranial nerves come directly out of the brain, um, or go directly into the brain, depending on how you look at it. And we, we number them with um, Roman numerals, and we number them according to where they come out. All right, so 
if you think of the top of the cerebrum as the highest possible point, as we move down through the brain, you know, from uh, cerebrum to uh, diencephalon to midbrain and so on, we're getting lower and lower in the system, right? So we, we label these or we number these according to which comes out highest. So uh, number one, which isn't on, on the picture, comes out, that's the, uh, uh, I'll show you a picture in a minute, but it's for the uh, nose, the olfactory bulb. It comes out way up, just, to, just below the cerebrum. And then uh, number two, that's the optic nerve. It's here, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So you can see that as we move down, the numbers are getting bigger. So that's the only reason that they have these Roman numerals. Um, and it's tradition. We, we have uh, described these cranial nerves with Roman numerals for so long that that's just how everybody does it, and it's one of those tradition things. So. Um, hopefully you still remember your Roman numerals because it's going to come up here. All right. Uh, so two, three, uh, here's four, a little tiny thing comes out between the midbrain and the pons. Five comes out sort of in the middle of the pons, and it's a big nerve, um, so it's usually easy to spot. Um, six, seven, and eight are sort of all in a row here. Nine and ten. Um, uh, Eleven. So this is where it starts to look like it breaks the rules, but... No, number 11 um, comes out lower, but where it emerges from the brainstem is higher. And then 12. All right, so let's go through each one. So cranial nerve number one, this is the olfactory nerve. Um, olfaction is the sense of smell. So we find at the, you know, here's the frontal lobe right here. Here's the nasal cavity. Um, so at the top of the nasal cavity, as we'll talk about in our special sense chapter, there's a specialized epithelium that can detect chemicals um, uh, in the air. Um, and that information is brought into the brain through cranial nerve number one. So this uh, cranial nerve number one sits just underneath the frontal lobe, just above the skull uh, that separates the uh, frontal lobe from the nasal cavity. So that's number one. Number two is the optic nerve. So this is vision. An optic nerve emerges from each eye, cross, they, they join and cross at what's called the optic chiasm, and then um, fibers project back to the occipital cortex. And remember, the left visual field from both eyes goes to the right side, the right visual field from both eyes goes to the left side. All right, so that's optic nerve number two. Muscles that move the eyes, there are three of them. So three four, and six are all muscles that move the eye. Number three is the oculomotor. It's responsible for most eye movements, um, with the uh, with these second two nerves being the exceptions. Um, so the oculomotor nerve also controls pupil size, so whether it's constricted or open. Um, and then the uh, uh, cranial nerve four is the trochlear nerve, and it controls the muscle that's called the superior oblique muscle. And the superior oblique is a muscle that rotates the eye um, uh, to the left or to the right. Um, cranial nerve number six is the abducens, um, and it controls the lateral rectus muscle. So um, uh, when the eye looks away from the nose, that's abduction, right, to take away from the midline. So we call this the abducens nerve because it controls eye abduction by controlling the lateral rectus muscle that pulls the eye in that direction. So eye muscles, there are three of them, or the oculomotor, trochlear, uh, and then abducens. All right. Now we get to a big boy, the trigeminal, <clears throat> cranial nerve number five. It is responsible for um, uh, all sensory information from the face, so from the front half of the head, all comes through the trigeminal nerve. So it's a very large nerve. We call it trigeminous or trigeminal because it has three huge branches that look very much the same. You know, Gemini is twins, so this is trigemini, three twins. Because um, we have a superior, a middle, and then an inferior branch. But you don't need to know this anatomy. Okay? As we're going through here, you don't need to know any of these anatomy pictures. I want you to know trigeminal, you know, oculomotor, okay? Um, <clears throat> all right, so sensory information from the face, and then its other big important thing is it controls the muscles of mastication. 
So your chewing muscles, the temporalis, the masseter, the pterygoid muscles, all of those are controlled with uh, cranial nerve number five. All right, so that's number five. Number seven, because remember, number six was abductions, right? We saw that in the oculo or in the muscles of the eye. All right, so we're going to skip that one because we already talked about it. Number seven, facial nerve, controls the muscles of the face. So we have a difference here. The sensation from the face comes in through the trigeminal, but the motor control of the face goes out through the facial nerve. So remember to keep those two separate. So facial nerve is number seven. Um, it has five branches, but we're not going to get into all that. All right. Number eight is the vestibulocochlear nerve. This is the ear nerve. If you don't want to say that big, long word in your head. Um, so it's going to carry information from the vestibular system, which is our sense of balance, and from the cochlea, which is the organ of hearing. So this is balance and hearing, hearing and equilibrium, number eight. Okay. Number nine is glossopharyngeal. Glossus is tongue. Pharyngeal has to do with the pharynx. So this nerve provides sensory and motor control to the, um, to the pharynx and to the muscles that are used in swallowing. So the glossopharyngeal nerve number nine. All right. Nerve number 10 is the vagus nerve. It's the cranial nerve that probably has the, the longest, it's the longest of the cranial nerves um, because it essentially innervates the whole inside of the body. So um, from the uh, brain, the vagus nerve goes all the way down and innervates all the major organs. So the lungs, the heart, the intestines, the liver, all the way down to the rectum is the vagus nerve. And it is it carries parasympathetic information to the organs. So we're going to talk again about the vagus nerve when we get to the autonomic nervous system. But for now, it's vagus uh, nerve number 10 and it's parasympathetic uh, uh, information to the viscera. All right, we're almost done. Number 11 is the accessory nerve. <clears throat> now, this is a nerve that controls muscles, skeletal muscles. The sternocleidomastoid, if you want to write that out, SCM is sternocleidomastoid. It's this muscle right here that rotates the head. When you look at people, you can usually see it because it makes a kind of triangle at the neck. Um, so it controls that muscle as well as the trapezius muscle. Um, so it, essentially, it's motor control of the head. You know, our heads can move in all different directions. Most of that is from the accessory nerve, cranial nerve number 11. All right. And then hypoglossal. Um, hypo is below, glossus is tongue. So this is motor control of the tongue is by the hypoglossal nerve. So those are the 12. Now... You will find, if you, if you Google mnemonics for cranial nerves, you'll find hundreds of mnemonics. Some of them are downright nasty, dirty, bad. So I did find a, uh, a, a colorful, or a clean one anyway. So it's, oh, once one takes the anatomy final, very good vacations are heavenly. So how do these mnemonics work? They're giving you the first letter of each of the 12 in order. So... Olfactory, that's number one. Optic, that's number two. Oculomotor, that's number three. Trochlear is number four. Trigeminal is five. Abducens is six. Facial is seven. Vestibulocochlear is eight. Glossopharyngeal is nine. Vagus is ten. Accessory, eleven. Hypoglossal, twelve. So they're all in the right order. So if you want to have a little fun looking at uh, what people have come up with, Google mnemonics for it. It's, uh, there's some good ones and some just terrible ones. All right. So, cranial nerves, you have to know them. Um, I, used to didn't, I used to not require students to memorize these, but um, I've heard from both nursing and OT that it shows up on exams. You just got to know them. So, um, uh, it's not so bad. All right. The Roman numerals assigned to each cranial nerve reflect uh, which of those things. 
All right, jumped in there, last few people. All right, so they're named in order of where they emerge. Um, so anterior to posterior, you could also say superior to inferior or cranial to caudal. But in, in any case, you start at the front, that's number one, and as they, you work your way down, you go all the way down to 12. All right. A kiss on the cheek would be perceived by impulses from which cranial nerve? <laughs> it's split between two, like almost even. So I got a few people. All right, so kiss, that's sensation, right? Sensation from the front half of the head, i.e. the face, comes in through the trigeminal nerve, not the facial nerve. So, you know, flip of the coin. Um, a, a trochlear nerve and abducens nerve, those are both eye muscle nerves. Vestibulocochlear nerve is the ear nerve, so hearing and equilibrium. But um, the facial nerve provides motor control to the face, but sensation comes in through the trigeminal nerve. All right. All right, and we are going to start some of this because th there's more here than you can see. All right, so from the anatomy to a bit about how this whole system works. All right, so. We classify the different receptors um, that bring information into the nervous system um, by in multiple ways. Um, so one is essentially by what they detect. So we have some vocabulary here. A nociceptor is a pain receptor. We have these all over our body, um, and you would think, you know, why on earth did, did pain receptors ever, you know, evolve? Well, they are a good system for signaling injury and preventing injury. You know, so we have pain receptors to identify um, stimuli that may cause damage to the body. You know, so why does a hot thing feel hot and it hurts? Because that's a signal that if you were to hold that object for too long, you'd have a burn, right? So by having pain receptors, it allows us to appropriately respond to potentially dangerous things out in the environment. So those are nociceptors. Thermoreceptors detect temperature. Interestingly, we have heat detectors and cold detectors. And we actually have more cold detectors than heat detectors. So um, instead of a thermostat that gives a number, we have cooler than body temperature senses and warmer than body temperature senses. So it's sort of interesting like that. Uh, chemoreceptors respond to chemicals. Now, we have these, we don't have these in the skin, obviously, but we have them in other places in the body. So, for example, in the aorta and the carotid arteries, there's uh, chemoreceptors that detect oxygen level and pH. So, uh, chemoreceptors change in response to chemicals. And then mechanoreceptors change in response to mechanical forces. So, all of our sense of touch are these guys, mechanoreceptors. You know, when, when you push on the skin, it alters the plasma membrane of certain kinds of uh, skin receptors, and that changes what signal that receptor will send. So a mechanoreceptor. All right. There are some others. Uh, proprioceptors give information on the position of things. So the position of the joints in particular. Um, and that the muscle spindle that we talked about uh, in our reflex chapter is also an, uh, an example of a proprioceptor. It tells the brain how long a muscle is. Baroreceptors detect pressure changes. So you can imagine that in order to control our blood pressure, we need some kind of built-in blood pressure monitor, right? Well, we have those. Again, they're found in the carotid and the aorta, and they're baroreceptors. And then tactile receptors um, um, are... It, it, really just one kind of mechanoreceptor, so they respond to uh, physical forces. All right. 
<clears throat> so adaptation. Um, it turns out that these receptor cells, they don't behave in the same way all the time. Um, and this sort of makes sense. You know, what the body or what the brain uh, needs to know most is when things have changed. When something changes, that's what we need to know. You know, the brain needs to know that something is different. Because as long as things are all the same, there really isn't anything for the brain to do. So the nervous system is set up to identify, recognize, and focus on the things that are new, things that are changing, things that are not the, the same or are not um, unchanging. So we have this characteristic of these uh, uh, receptors. It's called adaptation. And what that means is they change their response according to uh, how long or, or the, the pattern of the stimulus. So let's just look at an example. We have tonic receptors and phasic receptors. So we're going to talk about just this one first. All right, so this is baseline. Nothing's happening when it says normal here. So when nothing's happening, the nerve is just ticking away. In other words, it's sending an action potential periodically just to kind of tell the nervous system that it's there, right? So then we create a stimulus. You know, we, we push on the skin. So the stimulus is present, and now that receptor ticks faster <clears throat> because it's trying to tell the brain something's here. You know, I'm detecting something. So when that stimulus goes away again, it, goes, it drops back to normal so that the brain knows that that stimulus has gone away. So in these tonic receptors, they respond to stimuli the same way all the time. Okay? Um, now, the interesting ones are the phasic receptors. And that is, uh, here, these are receptors that detect change, and that's it. So, same situation, normal, nothing's happening. So, uh, we create a stimulus, you know, we, we turn on a, uh, a sound, let's say. Well, in a phasic receptor, it hasn't been doing anything. It's been sitting there quiet. When it detects that something has changed, it sends a signal, but then it stops. It doesn't keep sending the signal like a tonic receptor does. Instead, it says basically something has changed. And then when that uh, stimulus stops, it sends another signal, something changed again. So we have, you know, in some ways, the tonic receptors are giving more information. You know, they're telling the, the brain that something is here. The phasic receptors are just telling the brain that something has changed. Um, so uh, uh, the, the two ways that um, uh, receptors can adapt. So we have a lot of receptors that are like this. So for example, you know, when you put your shoes on in the morning, you know, you, you feel your shoes at first, right? But eventually, you know, by the time you're walking out the house, you've forgotten about your shoes. You're not really sensing the shoes on your feet anymore. And it, it, in part, it's because some of the receptors there are not sending any signals because nothing has changed. When you put your shoes on, something had changed. But very quickly, they adapt. In other words, they stop sending signals about something that isn't changing. Because all the brain is really interested in is what's new or different, because that's what it needs to respond to. All right, so adaptation. We have uh, uh, two different kinds of patterns there. And so technically, an adaptation is a reduction in sensitivity when the stimulus is constant. Okay. Um, and <clears throat> central versus peripheral. So if the, if the change is occurring because of the receptor, that's a peripheral adaptation. In other words, that receptor is not sending a signal to the brain, so how can the brain get any information from that, right? But there's also central adaptation where the brain ignores stuff that isn't changing. You know, one of the roles of the thalamus is to block conscious sensation about things that are unimportant. Well, things that aren't changing usually are unimportant. You know, the, the feel of your clothes on your skin is not, you know, it's not important for the brain to think about that. So it gets blocked both centrally and peripherally. All right, and that is where we're going to stop for today because we'll get into the pathways next time. So we're getting done a little early today.